Hip Hop Royalty is in the building. Thanks for joining us. I read about you some of your concerts and uh, some of your shows in this book that I got uh, uh-huh. just last week. I got through mm-hmm. it. And, hey, what a what a roller coaster ride you've had. Yeah. <laughs> what, what a read. What a read. I get to that. I didn't know, you know, so funny. I didn't know I had that much life. I did that much life. I'm like, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell you what though, I, I, I was very invested and it felt like I was actually there at some of your shows, you know. And some of the stories uh-huh. you got to tell in this book is it's absolutely yeah. amazing. Uh, but, you know, so funny, I never read a novel or anything like that before. Really? Never. Wow. At all. Just school, you know, regular school books, but how many read school books? You just go there and get your answer and get out of it. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. But I want to take it right back from uh want to take it back to the world class wrecking crew days. Uh-huh. You, you started at a club called the Eve After Dark Club. Yep. Can we that was that was the beginning? I'm trying to get my volume up. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the beginning because oh. I was a DJ before Dre even was around. So wow. I was already a DJ in the club, Eve After Dark, every Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sunday, sure. for a couple of years before Dre even came around. Mm-hmm. And then when Dre came around, you know, we became, you know, great friends, like brothers. You know, we just sure. we just clicked instantly. Uh-huh. And then we just that was the start. You know, we started doing mixtapes and bootleg record, you know, just little stuff by little mixes for the radio stations. Then we finally got started doing music. Wow. What would you say it's like about that? I mean, when you just explain then when you was DJing before Drake come along, what would you say it's like about them when, you know, in the club at at nighttime and, you know, I heard some crazy stories in the book. Yeah. What was it like about them? It was, you know, so funny. In the Wrecking Crew days, when we were just DJs, we felt more like stars then. Sure. You know, because we just, every Friday and Saturday night, you know, it just, and we was like the hottest teenage club back then. So mm-hmm. it, it, it felt more like somebody. Once we started doing music, it was more music and work and this and that. But the sure. DJing was fun. That was cool. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It was a lot more. I listened, you know, I've been a hip hop fan all my life. And, you know, when I was like, listening to the Wrecking Crew, it was always more, um, I would say, electronic, but then it was more yeah. electronic sounds. And, uh, you know, you had samples from, you know, the 60s and 70s. It's, it's amazing to listen to now, you know, going back on the history. You, you was the pioneers of, of hip hop, you know. Yeah, I mean, at least West Coast hip hop, you know, because New York, that was already there. Sure. But we, yeah, we just, man, I mean, electronic, wow. Mm-hmm. That was a totally different era, but it was fun sure. when we did it. it. It was just fun. You know, we, you know, listened to like craft work and stuff like that. Then oh. Soul Sonic Force. And then that was it. That's all. It wasn't very much hip hop sure. you know, in them days. It wasn't mm-hmm. very much. So we just took the sound and just made it our own. Sure, sure. Now, back in them days at the club, I heard was it Run DMT uh, come over to the West Coast for the first time. He visited your club. Yeah, it, I that? remember. That's how we got into music. We seen their shows because wow. they only had Sucker MCs out. Sure. So, so they had a 10-minute show. And me and Dre, I remember we were sitting on the sides near the stage or something. And we looked at them like, that's it? I mean, is that's how you do music? That's That was it. That was the start of us right there. That. That little 10 minute show, and that's it. We never looked back since. Wow, wow. I read in the book there, you've got a little piece about is it, um, John Master J. Uh, you were speaking to John Master J just after that concert. What, oh, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What did he yeah, say? Yeah. What, did you get any advice from him, or, or did you get any pointers, or did you learn anything from, from his kind of DJing? Um, more him was more just talking and hanging out. But from Curtis Blow's DJ, Davey D, wow. that's who showed me how to scratch. Uh-huh. I think Curtis Blow had came maybe a year before him or two years or something like that. It was a while before Run DMC came. Yeah, yeah because Dre wasn't even there when Davey D came with mm-hmm. Curtis Blow. And he showed me the scratching. That was, that was the first time I ever seen live scratching. Sure. You know, I heard the uh, song Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel, The Ventures, that one. But I'd never seen it live. And David D, he showed me. 
before the show, you know, early in the day, doing a sound check. He showed me take off the rubber mats, put a little wax paper, put a little penny or a little weight on the needles, and he showed me right then. Wow. Wow. And, that, and that's, that's how like, the classic hip hop, West Coast hip hop sound got started, eh? It's amazing. It's amazing yeah. to hear. So back in the early days when uh, you, you just touched on it just before, uh, you, you a great connection with uh, Dr. Dre. And read in the book, you, you call yourself the dynamic duo. What what yeah. kind of what how do, how do you reckon your friends should come together and how can you explain how you hit it off together or do you just get out together? Um, you know, we just click because when we man, when I met Dre for the first time, a guy from the neighborhood broke him up there to battle me. Because I was a top DJ in this in LA. So you know, he's on my turf. He wants to battle me. You know, I'm just like, look at this little tall, skinny kid. Who is he? You know, like, <laughs> do he know who I am? <laughs> you know, it's more like a joke and stuff. But that's how we clicked. And then once we started doing the, the music for the wrecking crew and got through that, and then once we got the NWA stuff, that's where we was like Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo. We was yeah. like hot. Uh -huh. Everything we put out touch was platinum double platinum gold i mean just it was just amazing mm -hmm. it was coming so fast we didn't even have time to think about what we was doing wow wow incredible so incredible and from then on you, do you remember when you met easy -E? oh yeah it was um it was during the um the later days of the wrecking crew dre brought him around i remember meeting him and I used to get free guest clothes from a girl at the store. I don't know why. She just gave me free guest I mean, stacks of free clothes. So I ended up start selling it to eat. <laughs> <laughs> he liked it. He liked guests. So he was, he was my best customer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we became friends. Wow. Wow. Easy with the design of clothes, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. So from then onwards, you, you clicked as a, as a, as a group. and. Um, how, how did the name come about, NWA? Well, it was from a guy out of a group called Yomo and Marky that I produced by myself. My first solo you know, group I produced. But uh -huh. he came up with the name NWA. He came up with it. I did not know that until me, Yomo, and Dre was together in the 2000s, and we happened to talk about it. And he said, yeah, you remember when I came up? I did not know he came up with the name. It would have to be, uh, I would say, 85, 86, early 80s, sure. somewhere around, right up in there. Sure, sure. And back then, I, was the world, well, was America and the world ready for a, a group called Kids With Attitude? Uh, not really. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> not really, because sure. I remember people used to ask us, what did the name mean? I, I used to say, you don't want to know what it means. <laughs> we was kind of not embarrassed, but just kind of, uh, we ain't going to say, just NWA. That's it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, you, you, you brought that, you know, reality rap um, on, onto, uh, onto the sound and uh, into millions of uh, homes across, across the world. I mean, you address quite a lot of, a lot of issues, you know, police brutality and and you know yeah. racism and 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 you know all that today it's still going on um you know yeah. back there was it last year in 2020 with george floyd i mean your your song kind of hit was it hit number one in the charts it was kind of yeah. the theme of we had the protests uh, across the world the protests in in the uk as well for the black lives matter oh really yeah wow. yeah it's uh, it was a worldwide um so much blame one of your you know your songs are F the police. Uh, yeah. um, it was I think it was F the police and um, I think two packs two packs changes was kind of uh -huh. number one number two kind of yeah the yeah they download they just downloaded it crazy and sure, sure. I mean you know what's so crazy we created the song but we didn't create the issue it uh -huh. was already sure. there before us from the fifties and the sixties you know sure. it was already there the seventies mm -hmm. we just happened to be bold enough or crazy enough to actually say what at that time everybody wanted to say to the cops. Yep. Nowadays, you know, last year, 
they right in the cop's face saying that, you know, yeah, yeah. you couldn't do that in my our days. You know, yeah. that would not be happening. <laughs> but <laughs> we just. It's amazing. That song was made 30 years ago, 31 years or something. And it's still there today. It's still the, it's the same issue going on. I mean, it's nothing different. huh? It's the same thing. Now people got phones and cameras everywhere. So they catching them little by little, but they got to start prosecuting them. Not just the one. They got to prosecute all these other ones. It, it, yeah, did sure. it, a, it did it a slow it down. Sure. Once you start getting them, it'll slow it down. Sure, sure. I mean, do you, do, you, do you think in your personal opinion, are we any closer to eradicating this racism and police brutality throughout the world or... I, I, don't, I don't think we are. I mean, it's more out and open now. More people understand it because you see all the protests. That was a lot of people protesting. I mean, all over the world. I mean, it was so it, it, it's getting the awareness is there. They finally like, oh, they do that. Yes, they do that. But it's, if it if, is it ever going to be fixed? I doubt it because this is not a perfect world. Nothing's perfect. So it's always going to be there some way, some way or form. I mean, all different kind of countries. Every country got different ways, different this, mm-hmm. racism, this, this, the police. You know, it's, it's so much. But can it be fixed a little? I think it could be, but I doubt it. Sure, sure. I mean, we could all pray and hope and pray everything, you know, stuff changes. And throughout the world, I mean, even here in the UK, it happened here in the UK, you know, this, this, the cases of police brutality and racism here in the UK. It's, it's awful to see. I mean, we're in 2021 and it's still going yeah. on. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just like, wow, don't, don't you guys get tired of this yet? No, sure. <laughs> it, it's just getting stronger and stronger, and, you know, sure. especially when, you know, our last president made it out open. Uh-huh. I, I've never seen a president, you know, has. He separated the country here. You know, you're on his side or not. It, it wasn't. A, it, it was just like, and they just brought it out, just in boldness. I'm just like, wow. It just okay. <laughs> sure, sure. So he kept it. He kept it going. Definitely. Wow. He didn't squash it or nothing. He kept it going. It's just, you know, it's you'd, a shame. You'd have thought it'd been. You'd have thought it'd been. You know. Uh, you know. You know. We had Barack. Barrett yeah. before before him and mm-hmm. he, he came along and I think looking looking from an outside looking in I mean I think he he came along and undone yeah. some of the good some of the good work yeah oh yeah he he just changed all that I mean sure. he just he just was out and open mm-hmm. giving cold words and all kind of stuff talking to certain people you know it's just like wow you know you're president and you you exciting this stuff Sure. That's his fan base. You know, that's his people. But they, but you know what's so crazy? This year, like me, this was the first time I ever voted. Really? I had never voted. Never, never thought being in music and doing music, it ain't that we didn't we wasn't pop, we didn't do politics, you know. Because sure. yeah, think about politics. You vote for something and they still do the opposite of what you voted against. Exactly. So it's just like, what is the purpose? So it's about what they want. Cool. It ain't about the people. Just like hospitals. Think about hospitals. The hospitals are about the bill. It ain't about your health. None yeah. of that. It's about do you have insurance? Can you afford? You know, it's about the bill. And oh. society is just backwards right now. Exactly. It, 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 it's it's a shame. And I don't talk this political ever, but it, it's reality. That's what it is. Oh, sure. I mean, over here in the UK, we have a we have the NHS, which is um, which is free at the moment, but we're going backwards. We're going backwards in the United Kingdom. I think um, with all this, this COVID and, um, you know, it's putting a lot of pressure on the NHS. So yeah. it, it talk, they're now talking about private, private, private privatization of the NHS, which yeah. into, we're going to be paying for treatment and this and that and the other. So we, we, we're kind of, I don't know, 15, 20 years behind America because I, I know you guys yeah. pay for your medical insurance and, 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 you yeah. know, all that stuff. So we're oh, yeah. going to- I like Canada because Canada is free. Really? Always free. Just totally free. Sure. Oh, yeah. Any citizen, free medical. 
And know, that's how it that, should be. I think, I think that's how it yeah. should be, you know, people's health. And- think about it. These countries got enough money, making enough money off of taxes and this and that. And that. It could be free, but the medical business is a big business. Thinking about the thinking about the drugs, the prescriptions, billion, trillion dollar business. You know, that's just too much money. Exactly. And, you know, these people, politics, all of them making money one way or another. For they sure. might have investments in that company, this company. You know, it just so the world is crooked. It's a shame. It's supposed exactly. to be nice and peaceful, but it's not. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm on the same view as, as yourself. It's uh, crooked. It's crooked, yeah. and we should, I mean, it should stop. But I mean, we can hope and pray. We can hope and yeah, pray. Yeah, that's it. That's all you can do. I mean, that the, the song going back to that song, "Elite," which from your um, 1988 straight out of Compton album. I heard it was you was banned from from the release party or something like that. What was oh, it was uh, it it was the it was our release party for the album, and it was in like a a, a kind of bougie uh, called Beverly, not really Beverly Hills, but somewhere near there. And sure. I remember us coming up because we all came together. We get up to the door because it's all glass. So you can see inside, mm-hmm. packed house, but we couldn't get in the house. <laughs> it's just because of the way we dress. I'm like, but this is our party. We can't get in our own building. It, it, it was like, wow. And we didn't get in either. <laughs> That's absolutely crazy. That yeah. is crazy. That they actually, you know, they didn't let you into your own release party. That's yeah, <laughs> well, unbelievable. Again, with that song, it's such a huge record. You know, F the Fleet, and you went on there. Talk to me about the 1989 tour. Um, mm-hmm. the, was it 40, 40 nights and forty shows? Uh, forty shows, forty wow. shows. And the deal was before we did the shows. In order to get the insurance and all that for the building, we had to sign a paper not to perform that song. Oh, wow. If we didn't perform that song in 39 cities, except <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> that, Detroit was kind of smacked in the middle of the tour, like show number 20 or 21 or something. Uh-huh. That's the only time we did the song. And we only got not even half a cube's verse. And it was over. <laughs> It was something like the movie. The movie overdramatized it. They ran us off the stage, but you know, we just all ran back to the hotel and then they caught us in the elevator. And then we ended up with a, a $150 ticket. So we didn't get arrested or nothing, but sure. That was the only time we played that song. We ever played that song. Ever. We never played the group, never performed that song. Wow. Wow. Crazy, that's absolutely crazy. Yeah, I did see it in the movie, and you know, yeah. when you started to perform it, you know, we, we you seen it in the movie, uh, yeah. the, the crowd just went crazy. Was that yeah. what it was like? Was like, you see the crowd's faces? What, what was the reaction of the crowd? In what, what it was, I mean, when we started the song, because I didn't, the thing was, only Cube and Dre knew they was gonna do the song, really. Rand didn't know, I didn't know, because when they wow. played it, I heard them, and I turned around at Dre. I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So the crowd, you know, I'm telling you, the song barely got on. But then the police in the audience, they was undercovers in the audience throwing firecrackers and stuff. Wow. That's what made it look crazy. And then they came toward the stage. Yeah. And that's when we just, you know, all went different ways. Uh-huh. Of course. In the movie, it shown uh, with the... Uh, st- Stamping on CDs and and, and oh yeah, that, that was reality. I really, mean, really, yeah. Some group, I don't know who it was. They would buy a bunch of our CDs and stuff, and then get a steamroller and roll over it. Oh, that's I, crazy. I remember looking at that on the news, and I said, at least they bought it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the main thing. I mean, did, when when the police shut the on the stage and kind of shut, shut down in Detroit and uh, you got the and on top of that you got the warning from the FBI and did that just make NWA bigger and, and in a way? Well the FBI happened before the tour oh, okay. you know, early after the album and when M- MTV banned the video straight out of Compton right it just it went up from the MTV and then the FBI 
went through the roof. That was it. We needed that. We, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, it, it, you know, watching it on, on the movie, it's like it's actually happened. It's like, you know. Yeah. Well, you, you, you was actually there, you know, spitting the truth. You know, you were putting the truth what, what you guys see onto uh, onto records, and I think that was uh, like I say, you you, you pine, pioneered this uh, gangster rap. Just the, like the colors you got on black, that, that black we like. We didn't create the black look, but all the football teams and all the basketball, everybody got black uniform alternates or something. You know, they when ain't just the Raiders, just all the team. You know, just like it, we didn't try to start it. We just that's what we wore. Exactly. <laughs> and, it exactly. Just, and it just caught on and caught on, and still to this day, that a, a look people still use, still wear. Sure. Yeah, we've seen that in the in the movie. Was it easy's idea to wear black and kind of the Raiders? The Raiders. Uh, I, I I don't think so. That was just for the movie. Oh, I see. But I used to always wear different from everybody. I used to wear the Dodgers. Oh. You know, I had you know the angel. I even the Straight Outta Compton album. I had an angel jacket on, no angel jersey, but with a Laker jacket. Oh, wow. so it wasn't really. You look at the look at straight out of company cover. We don't all have black on. Sure. You know, everybody wearing different stuff. <laughs> just until later, then we start looking more uniform, looking like the black. But sure. We just that's just what he, he wore. And that's just they just did that for the movie that you know that he started that. But that was the look though, right there. For sure, for sure. Going back to that toy in 89. Is there any 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 other stories you could tell us about? Oh, that's all. I, I mean, it was that tour was like even the people that was on it too short, mm -hmm. quite a few people that was on the tour. They say that is one of the best tours because there was no violence, which they thought it would be sure. violence every night. And there was none. I mean, I mean, we did all uh, arenas, not stadiums, but arenas. And it was just. <laughs> Huge because we carried our own stage and it just that was just like wow, you know, 40 shows, 40 nights, and it was fun, but mostly because me and Dre would take turns sound checking every you know, every show. He do it this day, I do it the next day. That's how we did. We sound checked the whole thing, the mics, you know, check all the music, you know. Sure. It was just like once we was on the road, it was like a business. Huh. You know, you travel all night. Then you get up, sound check, then the show, then travel all night, you know. So it was just back to back. It was like four shows, maybe five a week. So it was, it was work, but it was fun. It was a great time. The, the second, to me, the second album is better than the first, okay. production wise, because we grew up. Sure, we grew up, but the first album is still. The better, it just not the better sounding, uh -huh. but just the classic album. Of course, you can't replace the original. Of course, but the second album, you know, is, is more. We use less samples and stuff. You know, more musicians playing it, but it was it was a harder album. Mm -hmm. And the people was wondering, can we do it without Q? That's when we came up when we did the Hundred Miles of Running EP. Yeah, because then that's when Dre stepped into his spot because Cube was one third of the rappers. Sure. So he left, and then people wondering, can they fill them shoot? You know, so Dre just stepped up because Dre only rapped on "Express Yourself" oh, and on the last song, just mm -hmm. one verse. That's it. That's all he did. But in the record crew days, he rapped. Wow. Him and clientele, or him and Shakespeare. But so the last album, he had to come up and be one third of the rappers again so and he and he filled right in he filled right in of course he had a he had a um a song on there called for life it was called the yeah. title that uh, the title album but there was a song on there called for life where again uh mt ren who said it was yeah. uh talked about uh, peter ratman and i think mm -hmm. easy had a verse on there talking about uh he gets treated like a disease yeah i mean oh yeah oh yeah i mean Think about what we rapped about is reality, real. Sure. When we open our door in the ghetto, 
that's what we rapped about. We didn't rap about New York, London, Disneyland, because we never be, had never been. So we only rapped about what we knew, what mm. we seen, what we heard, and stuff. That's it. You know, it's so crazy. Yeah, Compton was our ghetto, but there's Comptons in everywhere, all around the world, just different exactly. names. The Bronx, London, you know, Newcastle. It's all kind of guess, ghettos everywhere. But I guess that's how people can relate. They 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 just can relate. Cause think about it. We was underground reporters. We just reported what we see. Well, that's all we talked about. Exactly. Exactly. After the album was released, um, I didn't know this until I read your book. After the album was released, you describe as kind of heart and soul went out of the group. Can you yeah. kind of ex expand on that? Well, it was like, it was kind of really when we was mixing the album. Me and Dre mixed all the stuff. In the first side, of back then it was, a, you know, on the, on the album, side A and side B. We mix the first side A like normal. It take us a couple of days to mix one side of the album. But on the last, on the side B, we kind of rushed it. If you really listen to it, the first half is mixed better than the second half of the album. So we took our time very well on the first half. But the second half, we kind of, we did like a whole album in one day. You know, half an album that we, we usually do two songs, maybe three in a day mixing. So we really take our time mixing, but, and it was kind of weird, you know, it's kind of, to me, we probably one of the first, maybe one of the only groups, when we, we hit number one on Billboard, we ship gold, which that was unheard of for hip hop. Sure. We ship gold, but we was really broken up when that happened. So we didn't break up at the bottom. We broke up at the top, at the peak. Uh -huh. What groups break up at the peak? Exactly, exactly. I, I don't know what groups have, but we was. So it, it was just kind of, it's just weird. But the thing is, Cube had to leave so he can get big. And the group had to get dissolved. I say it more dissolved. Because... Nobody was mad at each other. Even when Q left, nobody was mad. It just had to dissolve. And that's how Trey got big. Because he kept doing music. Me, I stopped doing music once E had passed. So I, I was done with music. So that's why I didn't do music no more. Sure. But it's just amazing that at number one, the group was over. <laughs> Which is crazy. But think about it. It dissolved. But 30 years later, we number one again, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which is which is unheard of. I'm quite sure. Of course, very few groups. I don't even know if the Stones could do that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, you, you guys only released two two albums. I think it was two. two. Al People think it's more, but it's two albums and one EP. Sure, that's it. Sure. <laughs> and the impact you guys have had it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's mind blowing. You know, like you said, you, you kind of the group kind of bowed out at, at the top, like yeah. Think, you know, number one is. I mean, because think about it, it's kind of better we broke up with just the two albums instead of making four or five. Then sure. they start getting weaker and weaker, and yeah, ain't nobody listened to. You. Yeah, we yeah, exactly. broke up. Ah, it was right there. And Thirty years later, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it Dre leaves shortly. Just shortly after that, you get a phone call. Um, I think we did some, we did a couple of videos and stuff. Okay. But it was kind of when we were doing the video, always into something, the um, appetite for destruction. You know, we started doing the video. It kind of, it wasn't the same then, you know, it, was, it really wasn't the same until he actually left. But for sure. It's crazy. The group had to break up. It had to. Yeah, exactly. You know, what was your kind of feelings? Because I, I know, you know, Cube left and the No Vaseline yeah. song come about and Dre left and I think Easy and Dre was going yeah, they went back, back and yeah. forth. Uh, what was it? He was kind of banging the middle, you know, you, you're friends yeah. with Easy, but and you're friends with Dre. What was your think kind about, of feeling? Think about this. When he left, he asked me, am I coming with him when he left? 
But at the time, I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, he called me one morning. He said, I'm gone. That's the words. I'm like, okay. Yeah, he said, I'm gone. Are you coming? And I said, I'll let you know. And it took until 2019 when I gave him an answer. <laughs> 2000. Because wow. it's at the end of the book, the last picture of me and him together. That was the day, that night, I told him. <laughs> you give me his answer. <laughs> and it was, you know, I was just caught because I, I didn't answer him. I didn't say, I'm going to go with E. I'm going to go. I should have went with him, but I didn't. I didn't do anything. So I was just caught in the middle and I got pushed on to E, even though I had nothing wrong with E. Nothing wrong, but I'm kind of glad I stayed. You know, oh, definitely. Not. Wasn't nobody else there. So I'm kind of glad I stayed. Sure, sure. I mean, what, what, was, what was the atmosphere like? Because like you say, you, you, you stuck there with E. And what was the atmosphere like when he was recording with Easy after the group got kind of dissolved? It was, um, it was a little different because all the deals we had, think about all these deals we got, we weren't coming back with albums, you know, to follow them up. So the deals, all these deals started getting messed up. And then he left priority. You know, I know why he left. I remember, but yeah, he left and went to re relativity. That's when he did his last couple of solo things, but it was just different. It was just like, uh, but I was still there. You know, I still, that's when we, um, when we met bone thugs, and, you know, we met them and then, they came right at the tail end. I mean, really right at the tail end. To me, that was the last real ruthless group was Bone Thugs. Bone Thugs. And it's kind of not like the real ruthless because Dre, all that was already over when sure. they came around. So they were just there. Just there. Of course. Of course. I mean, they, they've, they themselves, they've lasted, you know, going back from, what, early to mid nineties, up until still making music now. You know, yeah. Maybe maybe if, if uh, a few of the members have released yeah. really solo projects, but solo yeah. albums, and but still there. You know, they're still hitting the hit. You know, they're still getting the hits out there. And you know, I think that was oh, yeah. a, a great um, a great thing to come out of um, yeah the whole situation. You know, um, oh, the yeah. discovery oh, of yeah. both thugs. But I mean, seen in the movie. It was yourself who delivered the well. That, the that see, that's what I said. That was like Hollywood, right? Sure, there. sure. When I seen E in the hospital, he was already in the coma. I didn't talk okay. to him at all. Okay. I talked to him before he got in the coma, but he never told me what was going on. Sure, at all. Uh -huh. I had discovered. You know, I don't like to say I discovered him, but I had. Me and E was did a show in Cleveland. Okay. And these five young guys came up to me rapping, you know, singing, rapping. I was like, what is this? You know, that's that was a totally different style. You know, that was like, what is this? Wow. And I said, hey, y'all go talk to him over there. <laughs> and I sent them to eat. And then by the time me and him got back from the road, they was in L.A. Sure. And something, yeah, they got a, gray, a greyhound back to uh, yeah. yeah, they oh. They came from Cleveland. To LA on a Greyhound on wow. one big bag of chips. Wow. One bag. That's and they had no money. <laughs> <laughs> that paid off for paid off for for sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You 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 took on E there, you know, he got he got ill. I mean, and um he ended up in hospital and sadly passing away. But you're yeah. touching up on on this uh, on the situation in your book. Uh -huh. For me, for me as a fan, as a you know, a huge hip hop fan, NWA fan, it was, uh -huh. it was emotional to read. You know, and yeah. oh, really? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> kind of emotional to read. And you know, uh -huh. your last conversations with E and yeah, phone you up. Uh, did he phone you up when you was doing a a, a video at his house? Yeah, I was. I was shooting a movie. You know, I was shooting a movie at his house. And I remember him calling me, and he said, "You know, watch yourself." I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I don't know what he's talking about. He said, and he said that maybe two or three times. He said, watch yourself. He didn't say watch yourself from the girls. 
He just said, watch yourself. Sure. But after I got off the phone and then I uh, kind of heard what he did, because he never told me why he was in the hospital, nothing. He never told me because he just didn't want me to know for some reason. Sure. So I kind of figured out, I said, oh, you talk about watch yourself with the girls. That's what he wanted to say, but he didn't say it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it was a, it was a strange time. It was, it was weird. And, right, and that's when, when I was at the cemetery and they put the dirt on him, pounded it down. You know, it was over. All the people left and it was just a couple there. And that's the day I said, I'm done with music. Wow. No more for me. That was it. That was just that quick. I didn't even think about it. I was like, eh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, how did you come to that decision? What was it? What was, what was the, you know, the the the, the dis- What made you come to that decision? Was it because you know, easy passed away? You, it- I think it was just more. Yeah, he passed, but it was just okay. I'm done. That, that's it. I'm good with me. See, Dre kept going and doing music. I just didn't. I just I, I'm good. You know, I can make a little and be good. I don't have to make a lot and do all that. I ain't got to do all that. Because I'm more, yeah. I'm just, me personally, I'm just kind of relaxed. Yeah. More humble. I'm like, okay. I did the music. Done. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I actually seen a clip on YouTube of the, uh, the funeral. And um, was you with um, Lil Easy? Was the, was it the- he was little. He was one. Matter of fact, when they, when they showed the star digging of the dirt, the tallest one was Little E. And then the other one was my godson, Derek, E3. E3 so that was both of them now. Yeah, they was young. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I always, I always thought he was a little, little easy, you know, because you, yeah. you was one on each side, I think. And yeah. seeing you toss the dirt on, on, on him. He was, only the, he was the only member of NWA to go to the funeral. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I just, I, you know, I didn't talk about nobody. I just, hey, I, I went to the funeral. That's all I talked about. So. Sure. I mean, everybody have their own reasons or for whatever it is. Some people can't handle it. You know, I don't know, but I went. So I didn't want to go, but I went. Uh-huh. Of course, of course. In 1996, you produced the Easy's last album. Was it uh, straight off the yeah. streets of Compton? Um, uh-huh. That album, wow. I think you produced, produced more. Yeah. You produced Almost it, you? about eight songs or something like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Wow. And then following up from that, was it the um, the greatest hits of NWA? Was that around the same era? I did all that the same. My solo album, E solo album, and the greatest hits, the first greatest hits, of course. the one that said the world's most dangerous, the great. Yeah, I did all yeah, three yeah. of them at one time. <laughs> wow. And then you did your was it debut album? Yeah, that was the only album I ever done. Yeah, of course. Of course, I yeah. was actually listening to it the uh, the other night, and wow, you 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 really uh, you really did a, a great job, and I think it was an awesome job, and you know keeping Easy's memory alive. Yeah, yeah. But I think you had those uh, PG Knockout on there, and yeah. a few other artists. Yeah, yeah, a few of the ruthless ones that was around with E on on uh, his songs, and yeah, it was quite a few up. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, something that I, I did read and. Didn't know anything about that. You, you got come into your life, um, mm-hmm. but, but later on in the book, yeah. yeah. Can you expand on how that came about? Oh yeah, I mean, I had a bunch of life, you know, buying what I want, doing what I want. Sure. Then in 2010, it came all not crashing down, but it came to an end. Sure. And I was homeless for three and a half years. Not on the street homeless, but not having my own house and this mm-hmm. and, you know, just coming from this to be where you can't even see it. Wow. Most people can't handle that. Most people shoot themselves, commit suicide. Most of them, you know, to come from this and being all that to nothing. Uh-huh. And so what it is, God had to strip everything, get everything out of me. Then he came and got me. And it's been in November to be nine years. Wow! Since I've been saved, yeah. And I, I, I'm a deacon in the church awesome. every Sunday, every Tuesday Bible study. Because I tell people this all the time: 
when I did the adult movies, when I did music, mm-hmm. I was a hundred percent doing it. Sure. You know, I was all in. So when God came and got me, I don't know no other way, but all in. All in. I don't play with this. I mean, it's just it. I ain't looking back at the past because all the sin I did not is out of me. Mm-hmm. It's completely out of me. He gave me a wife, a church, you know, the family, everything. It just, I have not looked back. He even told me to DJ. I never wanted to DJ ever again. Because me and Dre, we was only DJs in the record crew. Sure. But once we got to the, the big group, we weren't DJs no more. Yeah, we DJ on stage, but mm-hmm. that's it. We were just producers. Sure. But yeah, he, he had me DJing and then the movie came out. You know, so crazy. The movie didn't come out until I got saved. Wow. They've been trying to make that movie for 10 years. 10 years they've been trying to make that movie. When I got saved in November 2012, the next couple of months, Q called me and said, Universal just picked up the movie. Just like that. And God had already given me DJ in December of 2012. Wow. Ten months later, I was married. Because women was my, it wasn't drugs, it wasn't alcohol, it was women. I loved women. Women, of and course. He gave me a wife within 10 months. Because I, I, I listened to him and I obeyed. Of course. He said, do this, do this. That's what I do. I don't question, well, should I? No, I just, okay, that's what you want me to do. Sure. And I've been I- to a hundred countries since the movie. Sure. Uh-huh. I've been to more countries than NWA Wrecking Crew did shows in the States by myself. So I've been to Vietnam, Sri Lanka, all over Australia, all over the UK, all over Europe, Bahrain, Switzerland, Bali. I mean, it's so many places, China, Malaysia, you know, it's just so many places. It's just, but I just listened because uh-huh. I did not want to DJ ever. I thought nothing about DJing. Cool. But I just listened to him and boom. And I have not looked back. You know what the crazy part is? I've been doing this in the past few interviews. The people usually ask me, so what are you going to do now? Or just like that. Like the book. I did not want to write a book. I never thought of writing a book. I never read a book. Uh-huh. He told me, God told me to write the book. During the whole year and a half of the pandemic, I wrote the book. How can I remember all this detail? Sure. It was all him. Because I didn't do it for money. I didn't write the book for money. It was to show how good God was. Even took a bad person like me. Sure. And still came and got me. Wow. Wow. <laughs> still came and got me. So that lets you know if he can get me, he can get anybody. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm so glad that you've, you know, you've, you found that path, and you, you, you know, you, you found that happiness again. You know, like yeah. he, he was homeless for a few years, and yeah, and uh, you, you know, you found you, you did find. But God you know and, what the crazy part is? Peace and joy don't come from money. Sure. Back then, all that money and all this, you think you got happiness and joy. It's not. Let that money run out. You'll see how happy you're gonna be. When it run out, I got peace and joy now because it only comes from God. Mm-hmm. People trying to buy it, they're trying to steal it, they're trying to find it. You can't. He have to give it to you. And it's so simple. I was sitting right here in the same spot and I was looking down the hall and I looked, I said, this is peace and joy. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about, it's just like, that's what these billionaires, zillionaires are looking for. If you don't have God, you ain't going to get it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we need more of you, DJ Yellow. We need more of you. You know? <laughs> you know what the crazy part? I was trying to tell you what I've been doing in the past interview. They usually ask me what I'm doing now. And I this is what I'm starting to tell them. I'm going to be a preacher. Oh, wow. Not by me wanting to be one. No. This is what I'm going to be. Okay. This is what he want me to do. <laughs> That's where I'm going. I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be in a pulpit or just evangelist or what. You know, going around speaking, but sure. that's what I'm gonna be. Wow! wow. <laughs> so all think about doing the book. I could have died many times. Me and Drake could have died in the car crash. You know, oh, we, so both, sleep. Was, yeah, we sleep both sleep. Will, yeah. 
doing 100 miles an hour. Wow. Both sleep. And then we rolled off to the side and we woke up. And so we got back on the road within a mile. There's a truck, big rig truck, parked with his flashes on in the same dirt we was in. We can have ran into that easily. Of course. But it wasn't our path. We had to go through our paths. Sure. And then me, even though I did adult movies, that took me off my path for 15 years. But it came back. So, you know, I'm happy. I am. You know so crazy? It's more fun now being saved than I wasn't. People mm-hmm. don't really think like, ah, oh, you can't do anything. Yes, you can. Because sure. if you really love God, you won't do the crazy stuff. Uh-huh. You just won't do it. You just will not. Well, <laughs> it's, you know, it is nice, nice to see that you know the change, and, and you do, you know, you look really happy. And yeah, reading your book, it's all the positives. You know, the, you know, how far did you get in the book? Oh, the whole thing. The whole thing. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, wow. the, the whole thing. You know, up and down. You know, ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster. But uh, wow. You know, towards the end, it, you, you, you do go on about you know your path with God, and you know, yeah. But it's very um, positive book. It's you know, it's a really good read. You know. Uh huh. You know something. You know, you know, I don't. I didn't know what a good read was because I never wrote a book. But you know, everybody that read that really read the book. They, it's something they, they, they say it's, they always say it's a good read it's they really like that's how i know i didn't write it and as i know god gave it to me to write it because that's my testimony uh-huh. and, and you know so crazy i'd have been in all these countries now i'm sending the book to all these countries oh. i just sent one to romania i never been to romania just two days ago wow. and there's another country called malta oh yeah malta LTA. yeah just last night, he said, I hope I can get the book in Malta. I'm like, uh, just order the book and I'll go ask the post office, do you guys ship there? I don't even know where that is. <laughs> Why is that Europe? Is it, it's in yeah, Europe somewhere. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like an island or something. That's how I know it's God. It ain't me. Of course. It ain't me. Cause I, you think about the book. I didn't try to make myself look good. Mm-hmm. I just told what it was for sure i never pumped myself up none of that stuff for sure wow wow i mean in the book you go on about the uh the movie and how it came about you know you got the phone call from cube and it was released in uh, 2015 uh, i believe he was on the on the set as a yeah. was it an advisor consultant yeah sure consultant of course yeah well, how did how did it feel being on set and you know watching your history being played out in front of your eyes? It, it's, it, it was kind of weird, especially when I met the actor the first time. The one playing me, I'm just like looking like, wow, he looked familiar. You know, <laughs> is that me walking? Or it, it, it's, you know, it's so crazy. Here it is five kids from Compton just doing music, what they loved at the time. Uh-huh. And they made a movie about us. I mean, not just an after school movie, a real full pledge, big budget, universal movie. It's just like, sure. And then, and then the Hall of Fame too. The top it off, the Hall of Fame. The year later, it's just like, wow. Because when I looked at the concert scene, I'm just like, we was that big, you know. I, I never really, you know, because I never thought about it. We just perform, and that's it. <laughs> the impact was, like I say, it was worldwide. And I remember when it when it hit the movies over here. It was a massive thing, you know. Um, yeah. Not just not just hip hop fans. It was like you know, moviegoers, and you know, I yeah. remember going to um, actually on the on the same night come out over here on the premiere, and it was just packed, packed full of people, and you know, the atmosphere in the, in the theater was was amazing. You know, it wasn't, yeah. you know, especially when uh, he was doing the tour, you know, the eighty nine tour, and that came on, and you know, yeah. pumping the music and stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was, you know, it wasn't, it was amazing over it. So the impact that movie wow. had on it was, um, it was amazing. Like you said, you know, young kids from Compton and, you know, yeah. you've, you've made this massive impact. So, you know, I just remember it being absolutely, you know, huge over here with the movie. Yeah. I mean, it was like huge everywhere. Sure. <laughs> you know, just I'm on the plane going some country and 
the movie's on the plane. I'm just like, sure. wow. <laughs> that was more crazy to see than anything. I'm just like, wow. And then I could see a few people watching the movie on the plane. I'm just like, wow. wow. <laughs> must, be a surreal, must be a surreal experience. Well, you know, watching. Yeah. You know, they're watching your your story, you know, and, and uh, but would you would you change anything from the movie on your personal personal opinion? Well, the movie, well, the movie was I would say sixty to seventy percent correct because it's so much, and it didn't get all the story. You know, it's it's just too much to try to put in the two hours and twenty minutes. It's just it's just too much, and some of the stuff they had to make it look more bigger than what it is. You know, just for the screen and stuff. Sure. And some things happened in the movie that really didn't happen together. They were separate, stretched out more. So okay. I, I like the movie. It was pretty good. Sure. I like the movie. And I'm, you know, I am still shocked about a book. I mean, me with a book. And this the book is 93,800 words. <laughs> 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 and it's so funny. A lot of people that's buying it and reading it never read books. They sure. said, but I'm going to read this one. A lot of people have said that. Uh-huh. And I'm like, okay, maybe they get something out of it. Something out of it. Because think about it in the book. I even talk about early days of us, paperwork and this. And I try exactly. to explain me calling myself the big dummy. Don't do this. Don't do- read your contract. Get a lawyer. You know, so. You big gotta- dummy. You, you know, that made me laugh. You know, all throughout the book, you know, yeah, you big yeah. dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd be yeah. like, just like, you know, in the, in the middle of the tour, oh. that was the first time we did paperwork for huh? Ruthless. Oh. And that was two to three years into the music. So we didn't have no paperwork at all. All the JJ fans, we didn't have no paperwork. Oh. But we were just doing music. And then they had a contract and a $75,000 check. I like, I turned the book over and just, Okay, that's it. I signed it. <laughs> didn't look at it. Didn't know anything. Of course. But that was just, you know, we just learned as we got older. Uh-huh. We had to go through a bunch of stuff. <laughs> For sure. Going back to the movie, you know, it, it won quite quite a few awards. It won- like 44 <laughs> awards. Wow. Yeah, 40, 40 plus. I know that. Of course. Of course. Did it, it, I think it, did, was it nominated for... Um, was it an Oscar? For, uh, for Oscar? It got nominated, but we didn't win. Oh, yeah. wow. That's so amazing, you know, that story. You know, it's yeah. The impact of that story is pretty crazy. But like you said, though, like you said, you know, you've come up with a book. You know, you, you're probably the only member that's actually wrote a book in, what, a year, year and a half of the pandemic, and you've got that book yeah. out. And such an amazing book, such an amazing read. You know, and of course, you... you uh, you explained the Hall of Fame in yeah. this book when you got in, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Tell me about that. What, what was that experience that, like for yourself? That was different. That picture that's in there of me taking a selfie. Sure. But during that one shot, that one frame, if you look at that picture again and look at the smiles on our face, it was 1989 again. It was all genuine. There was no managers, no lawyers, no nothing yeah it was just us on that stage for that one shot i took two pictures mm-hmm. but a couple of seconds it felt like the old i felt like the old and then two weeks later we did our first show together at coachella in 30 years wow. that was the first time we was all together on the stage two wow. weeks later and it felt like the old for sure it felt like the old for sure, yeah. I've seen some of the clips on there. I'm going to have a uh, constant go over it. Any hip-hop shows, I'm kind of there. So watching that on YouTube, you know, I was so envious and jealous of people who were there. But <laughs> you know, I just wanted to be there in the crowd, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, I got, like you say, you know, you took the picture and you can see the genuine love. You know, oh, yeah. You know, genuine friendship and love that you guys yeah. have. You know, and, um, you know, going on from that, I mean, did you have any conversations backstage or, uh, you know? No, not really. No? It was none. We went wow. backstage, got to the award. Everybody got their award. And they took, we took the picture, but we didn't sit there and talk. Wow. No, while he was in, in New York, nobody talked to each other. Me and Ren happened to be in the same hotel. We, me and Ren hung out, but other than that, 
No. That stop. That's one second, two seconds on stage was it. That was <laughs> it right there. Because when you go backstage, security, this, managers, all this whole uh-huh. Hollywood stuff, but on stage, but nobody around. It was just us. Sure, that's a timeless. That was a timeless photo. Then you know that, yeah. that last picture. Oh, yeah. uh, so like I say, it's like I say, it's a timeless uh, photo. But moving forward with the, you, you know, you toured with uh, Lil Easy, and yeah, um, you, you came over here in seventeen, and you rocked the, you know, you rocked the show. I was back in there. Uh, oh yeah, up in Newcastle. Wow. Oh, was he there? What did he come to that show? He came to that show. Yeah, it was the. Yeah. It was actually, um. T-shirt I got signed. Okay, by yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think I did meet you. Did meet and greet that uh, that night, and you just mm-hmm. rocked the show. You know, the whole the whole show was was yeah. Fuck, you know, and um, remind me of the essence of hip hop. And but what I couldn't believe was uh, how how much I like Lil Easy. Is is he he, he sound like him? He's built like him. His manners is like him. He's nice, just like his daddy. His daddy was nice. You looked at part, but he's soft. <laughs> Not weak. He's just soft because, you sure. know, he's just like his daddy. He loved kids. You know, he loved his kids and stuff like that. But he just, he sounds just like, him. but E3, the other son, sound exactly like his daddy. Oh, but yeah. But little E looks more like his daddy. For sure, for sure. I've seen an interview uh, with uh, Lil Easy and um, he was all questioning because I think he went for the role of EDE in the, in the uh-huh. film. And was, a, a few people were questioning why didn't he get the role for his his father when was it, uh, uh, Ice Cube's son got the role for yeah. Ice Cube? Do you have but any? See, in- but see, Cube's son went to acting class. I see. I see. Little E didn't go. He was supposed to go to acting class. Because think about this Universal ain't going to be spending $25 million on people that don't know how to act. Sure. He's not an actor. You know, you got to because think about the guy that played him, Jason. He played that role. I mean, the hospital scene that he played because he's a real actor. He went to school and and they didn't want well-known actors in the movie. They wanted the story to be the star. Sure. Not each actor. Oh, he's been in that movie, that movie. They wanted that. So little E just didn't he didn't go to class. He's not an actor. I tell him in a minute, you're not an actor. So that's why he wasn't mad he didn't get it because that is, I wouldn't say if a super difficult role, but it had to be a role. It's hard, you know, filming it and I couldn't act. I couldn't play my own part. So that's why he, I think he didn't get, because he didn't go to class and they wanted a, a kind of veteran actor, uh-huh. but not a well-known actor to play the parts. And Cube uh, just happened to went to acting school. <laughs> And he really he fit the part, for sure. So, you know, when you, you you guys are over here, though, you know, you had the screen with I think there was a photo right at the end, uh, right at the end of the of the concert, and he was stood. I think he took it on his Instagram. He was he was stood in front of that screen with his with his dad, uh-huh. and he was he was in front of the screen. There was a photo of his dad, and he was in front of the resemblance. Yeah. Yeah, everyone's mind, just think. like he's just taller than his dad. Sure, that's all. Sure, little E is shorter than his dad. Uh-huh. <laughs> Cube, <laughs> Cube son is taller. <laughs> uh huh. Of course, of course. Are you still in contact with um, any of the guys from NWA? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, we still all talk, but everybody just doing their own thing. So, you know, because me, Cube, and Ren had hooked up and did ten shows. After the Hall of Fame, uh-huh. we did a bunch of shows. That's how we ended up doing the Coachella. Sure. The Coachella, you do it two weekends. The first weekend, we did it by ourselves. And then the second weekend is when Dre came. So, uh-huh. yeah, everybody's still good. Everybody's good. Yeah, no, we don't hang out, but everybody's still good. Oh, good, good. Talking about Coachella, you did the, uh, the hologram for Easy. Oh, was that, that was Coachella? way before the Coachella, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it, oh, is that it rock, was, I think it was Rock the Bells, was it? Was it Rock the Bells? Yeah, Rock the Bells. Yeah. Sure. How was how was that? How how was that idea coming about? And and what was it like being at you know on stage with a hologram of well friend? The crazy part is when you're on stage with the hologram, you can't see the hologram. 
Okay. If I'm standing next to it, I can't see it. You have to look on the floor at, at the mirrors. Then okay. you can see where it is. You, the people that perform with holograms, they already know what it does. So they know not to cross the path or get into the light and stuff like that. Oh. It was the first time I remember it was in San Diego. It was going to a sound stage, and I walked in and I just see E just standing there, you know, frozen. I'm just like, whoa, that. You know, I had to really look because I got some pictures in the book where I stood next to it. Yeah, yeah. In person, it just looked real. It, it, it's crazy. <laughs> it is really crazy and amazing how technology and now technology is even better than then. Sure. And that was like 2013 or 2014. Okay. So the technology is way better now. Sure, sure. A question on that: Do you, do you reckon it should? Do you reckon it should? That on on tour. I mean, I I've seen a lot of comments on the on the YouTube and, and, and on the threads on the forums. Then should I actually set it on tour. And I think they've done um, ones of like Elvis, and of course there was one of Tupac. I think uh, mm -hmm. Cella. Do, what, what's your what's your thoughts on taking it on tour? I mean, see, I don't know what the technology is today, but back then when we did it, the hologram had to have its own stage because okay. it, it it came out the ceiling. You know, because it have to have its own stage the way it's lit and the mirror or way, however they do. Now they might be able to do it on any stage. It's it would look nice with a hologram if if we would have happened to tour. I would have the hologram would work. You know, the nowadays got to be better to you know really have them. And so it, it it that would be pretty good. People, you know, people that didn't get to see even the people that didn't get to see us perform. Sure. You know, because think about after the movie, it's a lot younger generation got into the movie. A lot. I mean, it's like a whole new generation learned about us sure. in one movie. And that would be nice to do a tour and then have a hologram in the show somewhere. Oh, yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would sell out. That would absolutely sell out, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they wanted that. We just... Never got it together. They yep. they wanted that in London, you know, everywhere, you know, all around the world. But it just never. I don't know what happened. It never. I don't know how far negotiations got, but it just never clicked. Because I think it was going to be us, Eminem, Snoop, you know, yeah, the heavyweight, number of heavyweights. It would have oh. been, but it just never happened. Going back to the book, though, um, straight out, come to my. My untold story, you know, every hip hop fan should get this. You know, it's you, you put a, a lot of stories in there, which you know, I, I learned a lot from you know, going through really? this book. I'm a, a massive <laughs> hip hop fan, like I say, it's uh, wow, you know, every, everyone should get this book. So, where, where can everyone purchase a copy of this book from? It's a um, Strat, Strat account to my untold stories at Amazon, you can get ebook, paperback, or if you want an autograph copy. You go to my website, djyellowovenwa.com, uh -huh. and I ship them. I ship to, to the UK all the time, sure. all, all over Europe. I mean, I just sent, like I told you earlier, Romania. I never, I'm like, really? Wow. I mean, so everywhere, Switzerland, Australia, I mean, all over Australia. So it's New Zealand. So the autograph copy, I actually sign them. I actually mail them all. I number them and everything. So, wow, they are authentic. They not no. I do it all. <laughs> sure, for sure. And you know, to have a hip hop legend, you know, I've got your autograph right here on the set yeah. <laughs> you know, from the, the Newcastle concert. And you know, to have your autograph and to actually speak to you, you know, you, you're, you're yeah. a legend. You know, so that's uh, just everyone gets this, this book. It's an awesome book. You know, just just before we let you go, uh, DJ Yellow. You know, what what's? I know you touched on it before. You know, what's next? For yourself, I know you, you said you wanted to go and, you know, preach. and um, Yeah. Oh. I think that's what it's going to be after after the book. Sure. Then it depends on if, you know, they want to do movie, you know. Because uh, I have another, I have an actual script, too, finished, too. Wow. And it's a romantic comedy. Totally different. You know, okay. something different. So the book, then probably the movies, and then after that, it's just me preaching. And that's it. Sure. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's been, it's been, you know, one of the best nights, you know, just to talk to you, man. It's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a hip hop fan at heart, you know, and uh, yeah, absolute legend from, you know, Compton to the UK and back again and across the world. You know, and, you know, salute you and hip hop fans salute you. You know, you've made a massive impact in, you know, not just hip hop and, you know, music, yeah. but, you know, your lyrics and, you know, the group's lyrics and, you yeah. know, your beats, you know, you, they live on. You know, and oh, yeah. I appreciate I appreciate you taking this time. And I'm coming to the UK once all this is over. I already oh, got yes. tours set up. So oh UK, sure, UK, sure. Europe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got to keep a keep a lookout for that. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, you do rock the set later, time, you know? like later in the year or the beginning of the year. Oh sure, oh, yeah. okay, oh, yeah. okay. I'll keep a lookout for that for definite. Oh yeah, because you, know, you, you do rock the set like I I'm say. quite sure it'd be Newcastle again. <laughs> uh huh. That was an awesome night. It was just yeah. off the hook. It was late that night. Yeah. <laughs> it was really good. I think it was the uh, was it the old two in Newcastle. I think he was the old two Ritz. I think he was. Or... Yeah, because I think I've been there twice, maybe. Oh, okay. a, a Newcastle and somewhere a Newcastle in Australia too. So I'm, there's so many. I mean, I've been so... Portsmouth, all kind of places. I've been all yeah. through there. <laughs>